A crisis of this magnitude is a once-in-a-lifetime event. It's a shock to the economy, more sudden and severe than any of us have ever experienced. How do I fund my business? How do I preserve wealth? How do I plan my retirement? Now more than ever is when your earnings and investments need expert attention. Where others see complexity, we see opportunity. Turbulent financial markets may hold risk, but for our clients, they also hold potential for extraordinary growth. We provide a one-stop solution for an entire multitude of your financial requirements. Our insights in capital markets and emerging trends have allowed us to dominate Sri Lanka's investment banking landscape. As one of Sri Lanka's largest asset managers and non-bank primary dealers, we are able to access and structure the best deals for you. The endless time and effort we put into proprietary award-winning research provides a unique vantage point and a clearer picture of what lies ahead. We believe in transparency, governance and superior execution that helps our equity and fixed income trading businesses yield above average returns. Our outreach extends beyond these shores. Our investment banking operations in Bangladesh is a cornerstone to our vision to become the number one player in frontier financial markets. Innovation is at the heart of everything we do. Our in-house spoke technology infrastructure enables a seamless user experience whilst ensuring that our clients are up to date with the latest technology available globally. Our entire operation centers around our values of integrity, fairness, optimism and teamwork. At Cal, we would only sell to you what we would sell to our own family. We believe each of us is a catalyst that turns ideas into reality. Connecting those ideas with people and capital is our business, and your perspective is what makes us different. At Cal, we understand markets and you.
A very good morning. It's a beautiful morning here in Colombo, Sri Lanka. I hope it's the same from wherever you're joining us from. We are joining you live from the Bandaranaike Memorial International Conference Hall. And we welcome you warmly to Reform Now Conference organized by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. I think this is what we're all talking about these days, about resetting the country. And this is a two-day conference starting from and it will go until tomorrow evening. And first of all, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Ashri Veera Singha. And I'm Aditya Edri Singha. And we are the live stream host conference and we will be there with you two days and give giving you the best of the conference. Stay tuned. As we start off, I think it's important to know what Advocata Institute is and what they bring on to the table, Aditya. Uh, yes, Ashin Sini. Um, so, Advocata... I'll say this, just say uh, this part. You, so, after you finish, after I say this, you say this, then I say this. Say what? As we commence, blah, 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 then I will start. But after you say what do I say? Well? After I finish this, you say this. Okay? So, why don't you move it... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I kindly request you all to keep your phones on silent to avoid any disruptions during the conference proceedings. Thank you for your cooperation. It is with great pleasure that we officially commence Advocata's inaugural Reform Now Conference. We welcome the President and Finance Minister of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe, for the conference. I would now like to invite Mr. President Ranil Vikramasinghe to the stage to deliver the keynote speech. Friends, I don't know if there are any, any enemies, there are many around, but I don't see any in this hall. It's nice to be here again with Advocata, one of the groups that I happen to work with during my political exile, and therefore we'll find a lot of similarity in the thinking. I was Murtasa in addition to organizing seminars to start the economic dialogue. We are the advisory committee on economic stabilization can share its view with a much larger community of people who are interested. The economic stabilization and reforms in Sri Lanka are of interest to many, many people. But it's not possible for everyone to be accommodated in an advisory committee. Nevertheless, they should not be excluded. And the economic dialogue, the network which we are starting, will reach out not only to economists and people in the business sector, but also to academics, and I hope later on to the smaller uh, chambers and business associations at village level. So where do we start, first and foremost? Well, I won't go through the history of what happened. I'm sure Harsha will do that. And it will save me some time to deal with what we have today. Because the task first is for Sri Lanka to stabilize its economy. How do we do that? This crisis that we face today is a crisis which I look back in history and I found that I did not see such a crisis during the British time, or the Dutch time, or the Portuguese time. And the Portuguese period was one of warfare. The only uh, similar situation that I could come to was the collapse of the Rajarata economy, which led to the drift of civilization back here into the southwest. It was such proportion. It's hit us everywhere. And how do you go out of it? When the Thai crisis took place, it was called the Tom Young Kung crisis. I don't know what we call this. 
may be a hodda. That's what we have finally become with our economics. Well, the way out is through the agreements that we have with the IMF, the staff level agreements, first and foremost. I don't think there's any other way out. People talk of alternative measures, but that has not worked. During the Asian crisis of 1997, it was IMF that came forward to look at the reforms. During the 2009 crisis, 8-9 crisis, it was again the IMF. Whether we like it or not, we have to deal with the IMF. This time IMF minus Stanley Fisher. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is for each of you to decide. Then first and foremost, we have to come to the we have to enter into the standby agreement uh, with the staff level agreement with IMF. Now this is an issue which the whole parliament has to consider. If any member of parliament or any uh, party says we are not for it, then we have the right to ask, what is your solution? What is your alternative? Because all parties must abide by this agreement. When we are negotiating with the, when we are negotiating the IMF, one of the biggest issues that we have to face is government changes and the policies change. So the first issue is not the substance. But are we prepared? Are we prepared to stand by to support this agreement? If you are not prepared, then the parliament must take the consequence. That is very clear. We can't say we are for half and not for the other half. You have to take the whole thing in full. So this is a matter which not only members of parliament, but people outside parliament must also bring their influence to bear on those who have to take decisions inside parliament. It may be bitter, but any medicine for recovery is bitter. You have to take injections. So we know the path we have to take. First, we have the staff level agreement. Secondly, and more uh, important, is the sustainable debt. How are we to handle the sustainable debt? First, the foreign debt. And when you look at the official debt, are we getting caught into the geopolitics of the region, of Asia? That's the first issue. Are we getting caught into the geopolitics or can we navigate our way? So until you settle the, uh, come to an agreement among the official creditors, it is not possible to go to the London club. Second and the more important issue is are we going to have we got to look at the local debt now that has far reaching consequences the lazards the financial advisors are looking at both debts so remember the first part we have to look at both the foreign debt and the local debt it's certainly going to be a difficult time. I, I, I won't say no. The first six months will be difficult. It will be a period which we have not seen before. But we all have to go through it. If anyone has a formula, proposals, that will make it easier, certainly, I think we should hear it. And the parliament could then decide between these two sets of proposals. Otherwise, we have no other way except to bite the bullet. So how do we prepare ourselves? And in doing so, before we get on to the recovery, is the more very important issue of the social economic dimensions 
of the crisis. We have over 6 million people who have been malnourished. More and more being unemployed. How long will it last? And how are we going to support them? We are setting aside some additional money from the government, but you will find demands in companies that are doing well for some form of allowance or a salary increase. But to implement these reforms, to implement the restructuring, you need stability. So we have to look at the, uh, the social and the economic dimensions of the reforms, the restructuring that we are going to implement. We have already seen the economic impact of the shortage of fuel and inflation in this country. Impact which came on to the political scene and the social scene. It's only now that we are restoring or we are getting back to a stable system of government. We cannot have a second incident. I don't know whether we can stand that strain. So while looking at the economics of it, look at the social side of it. Look at the well-being of a large number of people who will be affected by this crisis. We cannot look at it merely in terms of figures. We have to look at it in terms of persons involved. So this is to me the most important part of the restructuring. How are the people affected? How are you going to cushion it? Even with the IMF, there's agreement that the vulnerable groups have to be looked after. But we have to find the resources. It's easier said than done. You've got to target them. And that is a task which I would like the whole of the community to be involved. Yesterday, I happened to meet the Mahanayaka of the Amarapura sect and the Mahanayaka and the senior priests all agreed with us that even the tempers can be used for community kitchens. So in different ways, I want all of you to step forward to help those who are unfortunate. Because we have to remember the other side of it. The gap between the haves and the have-nots are increasing. It has not decreased in the last 10 years, 15 years. It, it has increased. The disadvantaged groups are being pushed aside or being pushed back. And that's getting affected. It are one of the main characteristics of Dharagalia. And thirdly, the main instrument for social mobility, education, School education has not functioned for the last two, three years. We've closed down because of COVID. We couldn't function because of the shortage of fuel. And the main instrument of social, upward social mobility is now broken. <clears throat> how do we restore it? How do we, how do we ensure that we can reduce the gap between the haves and the have-nots? So this also means that we will have to have higher taxation. Even taxation on wealth. We have to resort to those measures, first for economic recovery and second for social stability. So in any plan for recovery, we have to keep this in mind. Then we go on to the next step. Just as much as you stabilize the economy, you must have fast recovery. As the next speaker will tell you, Thailand was able to have a quick recovery. What was happened in 1997, by 1999 was growing, and by 2001 or 2, they had got themselves out. So we have to take a path that will give us a quick recovery. We can't go back to the old economy. We can't go back to that model. I was one of those who were involved in 1977 creating that open market economy. But we did not keep up with the changes. We did not keep up with globalization. And today we are paying the price. So there's no need now for us to go back to the same system and get stuck with it again. Let's think anew. If all this has been destroyed, 
There are not, no need to rebuild on the old plan. Remember, we are also a country which will have to pay off a high debt burden. Debt burden. Remember that. So uh, we've been thinking in terms of a highly competitive export in the oriented economy. How do we get there? First and foremost, the time that we are stabilizing also is a time for reform, to change the laws, to change the systems, to change the institutions. The six months to one year, I think till about July next year, we will have to go through a hard time. That's also the time for planning and the time for opening up. Let us look at new sectors. One I believe very much is logistics. If you see the growth of the Indian, Bangladeshi and the Pakistan economies, logistics can have a, a big role to play here in Colombo, in Hambantota and in Trincomalee. <coughs> this is how we use our strategic position. So logistics is something new. Second is renewable energy. Look at the renewable energy we have in this country. Look at uh, green uh, hydrogen, green ammo uh, ammonia. The sale of uh, the sale of power to India. I think we have to seriously consider. <clears throat> I don't know if the two members of Parliament in front of me will agree. We have to seriously consider getting a report on the use of nuclear energy in Sri Lanka. More energy you have, more energy you can sell to India. At the same time, keep more renewable energy available here. <coughs> you have to think out of the box. Some are going to criticize me for the idea I have put forward. One way, we have to survive as a nation. We have to become a middle-income economy and then to a high-income economy. So these are two areas. Modernize our agriculture. <coughs> We must modernize the agriculture. Otherwise, agriculture will not survive in our country. Modernize our fisheries. Look at the new, look at niche markets, look at the new uh, technology in manufacturing, the fourth industrial revolution. And of course, it must be an economy that will mitigate climate change. That is essential. We have to go ahead. There are other concerns to be looked at. There will be a demand that we meet the goals of sustainable development. We have to look also at the issue of women. Who are half the population of this country, more than half, and their status. It's well known because when I look around here, I see a few women in the hall. If I went to somewhere in the West, there have been far more. So these are some aspects. Social mobility. This will require a new system of education. More people in technology. How do you get that edu system of education going when there is a <clears throat> ceiling on your spending? Ownership of land, I must say, all those issues are covered by this seminar. So I will not deal with it at length, except to say that we need a social market economy today. Just as much as we must make money and make bigger profits, there must be more money available to people. The housing needs must be met in the next 15, 20 years. We have to meet that. Poverty should no longer be existent in the rural areas of Sri Lanka, or for that matter, the urban areas. We are a small country. We can go ahead. Remember, we are talking of a highly competitive economy. A highly competitive economy does not run on low wages. A highly competitive economy runs on high wages and a high productivity. Both those are necessary. Without those, we can't go ahead. Then we come to another issue of trade integration in the region. Unfortunately, I don't think you will see trade integration in the South Asian region. No. There will have to be bilateral agreement with whoever we want. 
there is too much of politics involved for, for, the, for there to be a trade, regional trade, trade agreement in South Asia. So we can keep that aside. We can have integration in dancing, we can have integration in cooking, but certainly are not going to have integration as far as the economy is concerned. Where do we go? We have to look at the ASEAN and the RCEP. Have bilateral agreements with some of the countries, but also agreements with uh, ASEAN and with RCEP. That's a growing market, it's a big market, and the income levels are much higher. So let's look at it. Later on, you can look at Africa, East Africa especially. We must keep our really economic relationships with uh, Europe. And, all, and we have a UK that is looking for a role as the global Britain. So I think Sri Lanka can easily uh, get closer and have a better relationship with UK. And then we got, get on to the US itself. Uh, U.S. economy is also undergoing changes, and I think that will benefit us. But we have to remember one thing. Remember, the global situation next day is not going to be favorable to anyone. Let's hope 2024 will be better. But we have to get through all this. We have to find niche markets. We have to find the people. So all I can say to you, I think since, as I told you earlier, you're dealing with the issues, is are you ready to take up the challenge? Are you ready to influence other people to take up the challenge? How are you going to sit back? <laughs> Many people may not like to hear this, but in 1977 we wanted change. And when the government came, we made the changes. Few of us went into politics, others are not in politics. Some did some work and went back into business. Others stayed on in cooperation. Nevertheless, we made that change. Unfortunately, we could not take it forward. That is what happened. So now we need the change. In between came globalization. And this view that greed is good. I don't think you can go anymore with greed is good. That era is over. You have to be competitive. But our institutions must work. <coughs> there are a lot that can be done in restructuring the state enterprises. But where are we going to do the restructuring? What is the, what is the platform for restructuring? Many of you say send it to the stock exchange. I have my questions about it. The stock exchange is today identified not with the London Stock Exchange. There are many questions about the stock exchange. That a few people uh, control it and a few people rig it. Now, can I put any state enterprise uh, uh, shares onto that to help a few people? Either you all must change or we put up a new institution. I don't want any more arguments on that. If you are to use the present stock exchange, we must, always, we must all be satisfied that it is neutral and it will benefit all. Because this is a country in which all the people must benefit. All the people are suffering, especially the lower end, going to suffer the most. They must know that suffering has not been in vain. That has worked for the benefit. There has to be changes. There has to be rise in incomes. Workers have to be looked after. Good education facilities have to be made available. There is no going back to an old system. We are going to a new system. And that new system is what the young want. So then shape it yourself. Look at what you want. We are undertaking a, a review of all that we have done. We are undertaking, or we have given the Sada and the Samaja and others the task of looking at reconstructing the future. What do you want? So let's get those views. But remember, the first item on the agenda is the economy. It may also be the second item on the agenda. But it's without doing the economy, 
we can't do anything else. So I don't want to take any more of your time. You have uh, many interesting talks and discussions, and I wish you all the best in carrying out this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, if you could please remain on stage. May I please request Mr. Mutasa Jafarji, Chairperson Advocata Institute, KDDB Rimanga, Analyst at the Advocata Institute, and Dananath Fernando, COO of the Advocata Institute, to present the state-owned enterprises report to Mr. President. We are not only presenting our latest report, but also the reports that Advocata Institute has released on state-owned enterprises in previous years. This is a topic that Advocata Institute has worked on extensively. We hope the reform recommendations suggested will aid Sri Lanka to a much needed path to economic recovery. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, everyone. There is no political freedom without economic freedom. The word freedom means different things to different people. Yet at its foundation is a simple idea that we must have the freedom to live the lives we choose as long as it doesn't harm others. Economic freedom sits at the heart of this claim. We believe it is the essential freedom that enables all other freedom and indeed prosperity. With this firm belief, a group of academics and professionals formed Advocata Institute as an independent policy think tank in 2016. Our objective was to advocate sound policy reforms to put Sri Lanka towards a path that is freer and more prosperous. We believe the main driver of economic growth is only achievable by having simplified taxes, secure property rights, free flow of ideas and people, sound monetary policy with a limited yet capable slate that promotes free trade, competition and entrepreneurship that empowers creative destruction and also safeguards the most vulnerable citizens through social safety nets. In this space of six years, the Advocata Institute has progressed to become a key influencer in media and with policymakers. In this short period, the Advocata Institute has also been recognized as a force in the global think tank rankings for its work on policy advocacy. As Sri Lanka reels through our worst economic crisis since our independence, the country is in need of a fundamental reset, a rethink of policies and practices that brought us here. Sri Lankans on the streets want a system change. Advocata is dedicated to scale up our programs to discuss, debate and advocate for a set of new policies which can make that change happen. So that together we can build a new aspirant society that values human dignity choice and brings about prosperity for all. Advocata Institute came about due to the efforts of a few concerned citizens who were concerned about the actions of people who were espousing a closed economy, derogis, autarky, big government and homegrown solution. Our journey basically thus far has been challenging and what we have been able to achieve is to get our core mission which is about libertarian values across to our core market. We target young people between the ages of 16 and 35 primarily through our social media channels Advocata for English, Advocata Plus for Sigala, and Advocata Kural in Tamil. We also have presence in mainstream media. We have a serious threat of a hollowed society where the young and the brightest leave us. This 
conference is about keeping hope alive. It is a discussion of ideas that work. The need of the hour is pragmatism, not dogmatism. Let's reset Sri Lanka. Welcome to Reform Now Conference. I would now like to introduce the speakers for the first fireside chat for today, which is on learnings from Thailand's reform experience after the Asian financial crisis in 1997. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Birathai Santiprabhob, former governor of the Bank of Thailand, macroeconomist and financial professional. Joining him is Mr. Murtisa Jafarji, CEO of JB Securities and chairperson of Advocata Institute. Over to you, Mr. Murtaza and Dr. Virithai. Thank you, everyone. Um, this session will continue for about an hour, and it has been termed a fireside chat. So we are just going to speak about Thailand's experience after the 1997 financial crisis. Uh, I believe that if you want to get across any questions towards the end of our chat, there's a Slido platform, and you can type in your questions, and I have access to your questions. So first of all, Dr. Viratai, thank you very much for coming to Sri Lanka. Um, we had to change the dates a few times because of all the difficulties. Um, it doesn't look like this is a country under crisis, right? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matasa. A very good morning, Mr. President, and to the audience. Very delightful to, to be here. Um, you know, I agree with you. My, my first impressions when I arrived yesterday, um, you know, I, the, the experience that I had yesterday was not like a country is in the crisis, as it has been portrayed in the international media. Okay. So, uh, when your name was nominated, I looked you up on Wikipedia. And it says that you graduated from Harvard at age 22. Um, is that correct? No, that's um, <laughs> 24. Right. But still very young. So, were you a child prodigy? I, I, don't, um, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, a lot of good opportunities presented to me throughout you know, high school and university. That's how I managed to get through college education uh, you know, faster than, 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 than standard. Okay. Um, during a brief conversation last night, um, you also told me that you ordained as a monk for a short period of time. And uh, you also practiced Vipassana meditation. Uh, could you share for the audience how meditation has helped you in your career and as the governor? Um, very much so. I think, you know, Vipassana meditation is helpful for, could be helpful for anyone. Because the, 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 the truth of life is, is the interactions between body and mind. And, you know, we all tend to focus on taking care of our own body without proper, properly taking care of our own mind. So, you know, um, being able to, to cultivate mindfulness is very important, particularly in the current world when we have to deal with complex issues. And when I had to serve as, as the governor, I, I must say that you know, I wouldn't be able to perform my duty as well as I did if I didn't practice or if I had not practiced Vipassana meditation. Uh, but personally, I think it, you know, Vipassana meditation has helped generate calmness in, 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 in the way I interact with people and in the way that I interact with um, or deal with complicated issues. The other thing that is very important for a central banker, central bankers are always standing in conflicts of interest. You know, when interest rates goes up, depositors enjoy it, but you know, borrowers would complain about it. When the exchange rate devalues, exporters are happy about it. But importers do not like depreciation. Uh, but those who enjoy it always keep silent. So, but those who don't enjoy it, those who will not benefit from it, always criticize you. And, and central bankers need to be sure that we have, we have neutral stage of mind. 
with you know unbiased view to be able to carry out our function. Uh, so when I was the governor, I also tried to introduce meditation, mindfulness practice into the bank, particularly for for the young central bankers. I think it's very important for us to be able to carry out our central banking duty to have to have um, mindfulness and also to have mental immunity. Thank you for sharing the personal side of your life. Uh, if we can move on to uh, the discussion today, can you, for the benefit of the audience, set the context of how the Thai financial crisis in 1997 came about? Thank you. The, the Thai financial crisis of 1997 could be categorized as a combination of a currency crisis and a banking crisis. Um, a currency crisis because we had a very large short-term debt in 1996 preceding to the 1997 crisis. Our short-term debt that were coming to deal within a year exceeded the amount of international reserves that we had. So meaning that you know, all the foreign debts you know, could be called. Um, if they were not renewed, uh, we would not have sufficient international reserves to pay back the debt. Also, um, if you may recall, uh, China entered uh, the WTO in early 1990s. So Thailand used to have large current account surpluses all along. But then there was a drop in, no, sorry, we had, we had good export growth all along. But then early 1990s, our export growth started to, to come down. We had large current account surplus, large current account deficits. And you know, our, our current account deficit stayed in the range of about 7% of GDP for you know, four or five years, leading to, leading to the crisis. Um, current account deficits also reflected the fact that we had overinvested in a number of sectors, uh, particularly sectors that were not generating foreign exchange. But we used a lot of foreign borrowing, particularly the private sector, you know, had borrowed substantially to, to, to invest in real estate, in golf courses, in, in, in condominiums, property complex, um, and those were not, were not generating, generating foreign exchange. And um, on top of that, we also had um, fixed exchange rate regime. Um, that, that, that was a big policy mistake. And the Bank of Thailand uh, at that time was trying to defend the fixed exchange rate, basically using up all the international reserves. So we had international reserves at about um, 30 billion US dollars at the end of 1996, when we had to float the exchange rate in July of 1997, we had zero international reserves. It's a combination of capital outflows, foreign creditors calling back loans, and uh, using our of international reserve to, to defend the exchange rate. So that's on the, the currency crisis front. Uh, the other part of the crisis was a banking crisis. Um, we had a number of small finance companies. These were not banks, but they operating as if they were banks. We had about 91 of them, if, if I recall correctly, in 1996. Um, and they, they had very poor risk management work. And with, with um, the fixed exchange rate regime um, and the policies of the Bank of Thailand that was trying to control overheating economy. So there was a huge interest rate spread between domestic interest rates and international interest rates. And on top of that, the government would like to promote Thailand as an international financial center. So the government and the bank and the central bank were trying to encourage um, local banks to, to do international banking facility, mainly trying to allow them, you know, taking out all the regulations for what we call the out-in transactions, borrowing abroad for domestic investment. And so there was a big uh, mismatch, a big mismatch of, of currencies that I mentioned, borrowing in US dollars for domestic use generating bad revenue and also a big mismatch of maturity, borrowing short terms for long-term investment. So the balance sheet of the banks were, were very, very weak. And, and we also had asset price bubbles when you know, there was huge inflows com coming in. And if you may recall, um, early 1990s, Thailand was considered as a fifth tiger of Asia. You know, everyone had, 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 had very high hope for the future of, of, of Thailand. 
and with a lax regulatory framework, when the whole environment uh, changed, that led to led to a banking crisis. So, you know, to to recap, uh, we had combinations of currency crisis and banking crisis, and this currency crisis and banking crisis were um, originated by by firstly policy mismanagement from the central bank part. You know, we had what we call the impossible trinity. And as anyone who studies macroeconomics would would fully aware that you know, we can't have a regime with free capital mobility and independent monetary policies and fixed exchange rate. Those are the the impossible trinity. But we had that 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 system uh, before the the 1997 crisis. The Ministry of Finance also didn't want to support the change of the exchange rate regimes. Um, no politicians would like to have devaluation during that term. I think that's, that's, that's a fact of life. And it was not clear whether which organization had full authority or what exchange rate regime. At that time, it was a responsibility, joint responsibility between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance. The government also didn't want to slow down the overheating economy. And they all thought that you know, having... Higher investment is always good. We didn't pay sufficient attention as to the types of investments and the quality of investment. You know, um, investment in assets in speculative to support you know, speculation in asset prices, that should not be considered as, as healthy investment, unlike foreign direct investment that we used to get towards the end of 1980s. Uh, we also had um, what I would say a weak political system. We had coalition government, um, and the coalition government consisted of, of um, support from small parties. And you know, with, when you have coalition government with many small parties, it was always difficult to make, to make big decisions, particularly re- reform, reform decisions. And, and the other major factor that I should highlight um, is the lack of good governance in the private sector. Large corporations and the banks there were a lot of connected transactions between the mother company and subsidiaries, not transparent uh, disclosures of, of, um, of their financial positions. Um, the stock exchange you know, was also a problem at that time. Uh, a lot of stock prices manipulation and uh, not, not up to standard as, as one would expect for, for publicly listed, listed companies. Um, so that created a lot of distorted yeah, incentives leading to, to combinations of banking crisis and currency crisis. I think w- one area you missed is about the fiscal situation. What was the fiscal situation leading up to the crisis? Our fiscal situation was very strong. Um, Thailand had very high growth towards the end of 1980s and early 1990s. Um, the fiscal deficit before the 1997 crisis was in the range of 1% to 2% of GDP. And uh, our public debt to GDP was also quite low, a single digit, I think below 10%. Must have been running a primary balance surplus, right? Yes, for some years before, before the crisis. Okay. Uh, so sh- if we can move on, uh, what was the steps that you all took initially to stabilize the economy? Um, the maybe maybe uh, you can let us know what, when the crisis broke, what happened to Thailand? Yeah, the, the, um, the magnitude of, maybe I touch on the magnitude of the crisis so that you have a good uh, overview of the problems that we had, we had to deal with. The, the Thai baht was floated in July of 1997. Um, before it was floated, um, the exchange rate was 25 baht per one US dollar. And then the value of the currency is dropped to, um, at its lowest, about 57 baht to US, per US dollar from 25 to 57 in January of 1998, so within the period of, of six months. And obviously, that led to massive bankruptcy because large corporations or even medium-sized firms, they had um, external loans uh, through the Bangkok International Banking Facility lendings. And as I mentioned earlier, 
the banks, the finance companies were competing in getting cheap funding from abroad in US dollar and lending to. You had an open to, capital account on 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 inflows, not on outflows. not on outflow. The outflows um, capital account there were some restrictions, but because of the the over overly um, you know externally leverage of the banks and 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 the corporations. When the exchange rate devalued from 25 baht to 56 baht, 57 baht, you know, it led to it led to massive bankruptcy for for firms, um, a, a, a large proportions of, of of firms that depended on on, on external financing. Um, the the GDP contracted by about 1.5 percent in 1997, and further by a additional about 10 or 11% in 1998. So in total, two years after the crisis, G- real GDP contracted by, by close to 12, 12%. And it took us um, about five years um, before real GDP went back to the pre-crisis level. Um, the, the amount of distressed assets that we had to, to deal with during the Asian financial crisis was, was substantial. Non-performing loans in the banking system shot up to about 47% of balance sheets of, of the bank. Imagine, you know, half of assets in the banking system were NPLs. And, and these were the banks that survived the crisis. We also had to close a number of finance companies. Um, we had 91 finance companies before the crisis. A few years afterwards, we had 19. So we closed down a large amount of finance companies. And if you add up the number of NPLs on balance sheet of banks and the amount of distressed assets that we had to deal with, um, it amounted to close to about 70% of our GDP. So that's the magnitude of distressed asset that, that we had to deal with. But if we didn't do it, you know, we would not be able to return this distressed asset to productive use and you know, can't, can't promote uh, restructuring. Um, the... The back massive bankruptcy also led to massive laying off of people. And there were large amount of employees that you know, were let go by bankrupt, bankrupt corporations. Um, before the 1997 crisis, we had one-way migration of young people from the rural area to Bangkok, to big cities, to industrial estates. Uh, after the 1997 crisis, it was a reverse migration large amount of people had to go back to their, to their rural villages. And, and indeed, the rural economy, the rural villages that, that were, were not uh, affected badly by the crisis served as a social you know, safety net for, for, for a large amount of people that, 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 that went home. Um, public debt to GDP shot up afterwards, as I mentioned you know, before the crisis, is a single digit. The cost of financial sector restructuring was estimated in the range of 30 to 40 percent of GDP at that time, and, and the amount of public debt subsequently, you know, increased along the way as the government had to fiscalize the cost of financial sector restructuring. So public debt to GDP from single digit went up to 40 percent, 35, 40 percent, um, you know. After after um, we we managed to 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 to, to deal with you know, the dis- distressed assets and, and, and the banks that the government had to intervene and take control, and the livelihood of people was badly affected um, a- 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 along the way. But as the president um, mentioned in, in his speech, um, the engines that could support the quick recovery of the Thai economy was exports. You know, we had a um, diversified economy. We had a um, good manufacturing base. Uh, we, we were part of the, the regional supply chain. So when the exchange rate devalued from 25 to 56 and then stabilized in, at about 40, 45, the exporting sectors benefited substantially. Tourism sector also benefited substantially. And the agricultural sector you know, people who went back to the rural areas, they, they, you know, they, they could um, produce agricultural uh, products and, and, and generated good income because the agricultural prices went up when the currency uh, devalued. So because of the exports and tourism, that led to 
um, relatively quick uh, turn around of some 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 segments of the economy. If I can now turn to exploration, uh, what happened to the political environment when the crisis broke, and how did that solve itself? Yeah, the political environment was was quite fragile. Um, we had the the floating of the of the exchange rate in in July. That's when people say that's the origin of the Asian financial crisis. Um, the Minister of Finance resigned um, before the floating of the exchange rate. I think that was also part of the problem leading to the lack of confidence. You know, everyone was wondering. You know, the Minister of Finance should know something that people might might not know. Um, and then um, the government at that time didn't want to take any any drastic actions, and indeed um, was a bit disconnected from the reality of of, of the crisis. Um, the prime minister who conducted the first um, negotiation with the IMF package, okay, we conclude that negotiation I think about September, October. And then he resigned. He had to resign. Um, the public had little confidence in, in the cabinet at that time. And we had a new um, cabinet coming in in, in November with, um, with good groups of professionals that could command uh, confidence. But I should mention that, if you may recall, um, a few years before the 1997 crisis, we had a coup d'etat. And after coup d'etat, there was also a de- big demonstration in Bangkok, a bloodshed demonstration. So there was a public call for constitutional reform. Um, and the constitutional reform at that time, during that time preceding the crisis, uh, was considered as a public, a people's constitution. That's, that's what we call, even, even today, a lot of participation by, 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 by different groups of, of people. Um, and it was chaired by, by one of our most respected uh, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Anand Banyarachun. And the completion of that constitutional reform um, o- occurred around September or October of 1997. So we had, we had the reform of the constitution um, taking place a few months after the floating of the exchange rate. And, and everyone had a very high hope that you know, um, it would help change the political system of Thailand, which, which, which it did. So, so you said there were constitutional changes. What exactly did you all change? Or, or? Um, a, a few things. Um, one thing is to promote um, decentralization, mm-hmm. uh, um, having a central government commanding so much authority um, is, is not helpful. Um, so with the new constitution in 1997, we promoted decentralization. The other thing uh, was trying to address the issues of small parties you know, leading to coalition governments, and everyone was, was quite, quite, quite um, sick of having weak coalition governments not being able to address reform for the country. So the electoral system, um, we introduced the concept of party lists, and uh, that's by that way that promotes uh, big parties, mm-hmm. and, and and that led to you know subsequent election that we had uh, two big political parties competing. Uh, that created another problem, as you may have seen the red shirt, the yellow shirt, as you may have seen in in the news. So we also in the process of finding the right balance of our political political system. The other thing is um, that came with that constitution is to create what we call independent entities like anti-corruption entity uh, which would not be under political influence. Uh, We had a new uh, electoral commission to oversee all elections from from the national level to to the the, 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 the provincial level. So the concept of of independent organizations so that hopefully hoping that it would be little or less political interference into their work. So those were a few uh, key principles, if I may recall, of the new constitution that came in 1997. Can you briefly tell us, uh, your king is highly revered and respected. Uh, he has moral authority. Did he play a role in calming the nation? 
um, his his late Majesty the King um, Brahma the Ninth. Um, he, uh, my personal view is that he had provided um, a great deal of um, um, spirit. No, it's um, I would not say. It, I think one could say it, um, spiritual role and also um, you know, important guiding principles for Thai people for for the general public and also for 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 policy makers at that time. Um, if you may recall, um, there was a philosophy that the king highlighted post-1997 crisis called sufficiency economic principle. Uh, this sufficiency economic principle um, focused on, on the principles of moderation. Obviously, we had overly overinvestment before the crisis. Uh, people had you know, basically overconsumed, lived beyond the mean. So the kings emphasized the principles of moderation. The king also emphasized the principles of reasonableness. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever you do, make sure that it's, it, there's rational, strong rational behind it and reasonable. You, know, you may recall during that time we had speculation, we had asset price bubbles, and, and we had many, many wrong policies, uh, missteps, policy mistakes from the macro level down to, down to um, the household level. And another thing that was very important is the principles of immunity. Mm-hmm. making sure that to be able to get through with the world that would be increasingly volatile, complex, um, from the household levels to the national level, we have to make sure that we create sufficient immunity. So these, 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 these are the three core principles of the sufficiency econo- economic principles, and obviously it has to be based on the, the fundamentals of, of good ethics and, 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 and knowledge. Um, by, by promoting these principles, um, I think the king has provided, um, I would say, the, the light at the end of the tunnel for, 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 the, for the general um, public. He didn't intervene in, in the policy making, he didn't intervene in politics, but he, he, he did provide you know, something that highly valuable guiding principles for, for the society and economy. Thank you. Um, so can you give us what were the key lessons for the design and execution of the Thai stabilization plan? Yeah. Um, you know, if, I, if I step back a bit, um, for a crisis of that magnitude, there was no single panacea. So it had to be combinations of, of measures. Okay? And I can think of you know, maybe five categories of measures that, that we introduced. The first one related to stabilization. Stabilization package was very important. When the exchange rate was, was free-falling, we had to stabilize that. When people had no confidence in the banking system, the depositors were taking deposits out of the bank. Um, money market in the bank market became non-functioning, so we had to stabilize the, 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 so the money what market. what was the interest rates like? Um, it went up to about 25%. Okay. You know, Imagine depositors going to small banks, taking all the deposits out, and putting deposits into foreign banks or large banks. So it was uh, deposit outflows from small financial institutions to foreign banks. What the foreign banks and the large bank did, they lent that money back to the Bank of Thailand, and the Bank of Thailand circled that money to provide liquidity to the, to the small financial institutions. So this is like a vicious circle, and along the way, interest rates had to be bid up to, to, to deter um, such, such um, loud tripping behavior. Um, so when the money market went up to about 25%, no business would be able to survive. So we had to basically you know, stab- improve confidence, you know, uh, stabilize the, 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 the functioning of, 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 of the interbank market, the, the, the money market, while also... Um, providing um, confidence in the foreign exchange market. So that's, that's, that's category is related to stabilization. Um, the other category is related to fiscal stimulus. Okay. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have f- large fiscal deficits um, leading to the crisis. And the IMF in the first package, and they also admitted publicly as, as the mistake because they, they, they wanted... Uh, 
Thailand to to raise the fiscal spending. So they set the primary um, budget surplus target uh, in the first letter of intent, but we managed to negotiate with them and and substantially relax the the fiscal condition so that the government would be able to use fiscal policy to stimulate the economy. So that's fiscal stimulus, the second category of of measures. The third one is related to economic restructuring, particularly restructuring of the banking sector. Um, that's 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 very important because it's it's the the root cause of the Thai banking crisis. Um, resolution of distressed assets is also very important. We had to come up with a series of of measures from changing the bankruptcy framework, uh, setting up specialized agency to deal with distressed assets, um, auctioning off. Some of the distressed assets, setting up, you know, Thai asset management companies as a central depositories of distressed assets to allow for orderly resolution of distressed assets. Um, we also liberalize um, foreign investment um, regulatory framework. Although we had open um, FDI framework um, leading to the crisis, but the service sector was very much protected. So we had to amend uh, the foreign business law to allow foreign participation in in service sector and also privatization um, state-owned enterprises. There were um, quite a number of state-owned enterprises that created large contingent liabilities for for the government. So the third category is related to economic restructuring and, and liberalization. Uh, the fourth category that was very important. Um, And like to echo the importance, as Mr. President had highlighted in his, his speech, is protecting the most vulnerable group of people, um, the 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 people at the bottom of the pyramid got hit the most when a crisis like that hit. So we had to come up with with a number of programs to safeguard the livelihood of of these people, and 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 lastly, is related to to institutional building. Institutional reform. You know, the Bank of Thailand was a major player leading to the crisis. So there was a big um, amendment of the Central Banking Act. Um, there was capacity um, improvement in the Ministry of Finance. The new Public Debt Management Office was set up. Because dealing of managing public debt um, became became a big burden for for the Thai authorities. We didn't have to deal with public debt before. But then, when public debt went up to 30, 40 of GDP, we need to have a specialized agency doing that. We also set up a state-owned enterprise policy office to centralize the the super supervisions of state-owned enterprises. Before state-owned enterprises, supervisory authority lie with the Lai Ministry, like you know, Thai Airways International is under the Ministry of Transportation. Um, The other state-owned enterprise is under another ministry, so it became pet project of the respective ministers. So we centralized the super supervisory oversight by setting up a special office in the Ministry of Finance. And those are some examples of the institutional reforms. So What about on, on your points about um, about um, key lessons learned from 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 the Thai crisis? Given you know. A lot of measures that need to be put in place in the comprehensive package. I would like to highlight um, perhaps six key principles. Um, firstly, credibility of the stabilization program and reform program was utmost important. Um, credibility, you know, is 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 key, um, and it has to be the program has to be credible in the eyes of the local people as well as the international financial community. And we have to make sure that um, there's strong credibility in the design of the program and also in the execution of the program. So that's that's very important. If you have stabilization program or reform programs that are not sufficiently credible, um, there's a high likelihood that the program will not succeed, and you will end up having to have stronger program afterwards, creating more pain. In the transition, in the transition process, so that's the first one: credibility that I need to highlight. Um, the second aspect that is very important is the essence of time. The the previous the, the government um, that was in charge 
before 1997 floating of the exchange rate. They were in denial stage, basically. They, they thought that you know, the, the pictures of the conditions of, of macroeconomy um, situation were, were basically narratives of the opposition. And they, they were disconnected from, 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 from the reality. Um, and they underestimated the magnitude of, of the crisis. Um, they didn't accept that you know, the causes of the crisis were structural. They thought that you know, some of the problems could be dealt with by transitory measures. And by kicking the can along the road, that created a much larger burden for, 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 for anyone in the society, basically. You know, as we all know, interest rates, uh, interest uh, go up every day, right? One day that you delay um, restructuring of the debt, that adds more cost to, to the society. Um, and I also need to emphasize that in, in, in a crisis situation, obviously there are a lot of things at hand that need to be done immediately. Uh, but one also needs to look for, to have you know, forward-looking views of what could go wrong. And the scenarios analysis would be, would be important and make sure that we, we take proper safeguarding action against those potential scenarios. Sometimes we're focusing on, on, on problems at hand too much without paying sufficient attention on, on, on possible future scenarios. So we tend to react to, to immediate problems. But dealing with the crisis, when we have to talk about stabilization, talking about restructuring, we need to be quite forward-looking in, in the measures that we do by competing with, with the time. Uh, the third issue that I would like to highlight from our lessons is the fact that macroeconomic problems need to be tackled first by macroeconomic policies. Um, obviously, um, you know, macroeconomic policy, the like of stabilization, the way exchange rate work, monetary policy work, um, politicians might, might not have good understanding and might not appreciate um, those stabilization policies. And they often come with something they're quite familiar with, which are micro, microeconomic policies, microeconomic measures to micromanage you know, small things here and there. Um, when, we have, when we had large current account deficit, when we had you know, wrong exchange rate uh, regime, you could not solve that problem by having import license alone. You could not solve that problem by you know, restricting uh, capital flows. It would have, or it could, it, it did undermine you know, confidence leading to more capital outflows. But we need to make sure that the key macroeconomic problems have been taken care of by proper macroeconomic policies in the stabilization package, not by microeconomic measures. So that's, that's, that's the third uh, principle that I learned from, from the crisis. Um, the fourth principle that I would like to highlight um, in, in our case is, is very much related to how we had to deal with, with the banking crisis. In, in a crisis of our magnitude, it is impossible to help everyone. The most important thing is to safeguard the functioning of the core system. So we had to you know, separate um, the bad banks from the good banks. I mean, the, the banks that had liquidity problems, had insolvency problems, from the banks that would have potential to stay on and serve as a, as a core of the, of the banking system to facilitate economic recovery. Um, and, you know, we, we obviously the public would also be calling for help. Okay. We had to be very specific, very targeted about, about, about the groups of vulnerable people that we had to deal with, or we had to provide assistance because of the limited resources. We were trying to help everyone. Um, there's a high chance that no one would survive. Prioritization is very important, and it's a prioritization uh, based, on, um, based on the economic justification to make sure that you know, the core functioning of the, of, the, of the economy could continue to, to carry on its duty. 
Otherwise, you know, um, if you can't preserve the core functioning of the system, you know, stabilization will not, will, will not, be, will not be able to complete. Um, the, the fifth guiding principle that I would like to offer um, is that the direction of stabilization program and the restructuring liberalization program, you know, that tends to be on a medium to long term, um, they need to be aligned. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to be consistent. Um, when we talk about state-owned enterprises creating contingent liabilities of the government, you know, you want to stop that contingent liabilities has to be aligned with long-term liberalization of the sectors that state-owned enterprises operate with. Um, you have to be aligned with the privatization um, strategies. Uh, distress assets, less solution. We need quick resolutions, but we don't want to undermine good credit culture in our banking system. So we need to have quite a number of, of restrictions, for instance, when we auction off distressed assets. Obviously, the government would like to get as much revenue from, from, from the auction so that you know, it would reduce fiscal costs of the government. But we have to ensure that the debtors will not, would not be allowed to bid on their own distressed assets. Mm -hmm. It would undermine the, the, the credit culture of the whole system. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there were you know, nominees coming in here and there, but we had to, to, to be very, very strict about, about this principle. So um, the interaction between the design of stabilization programs and the long-term restructuring programs have to go hand in hand and, and, and need to be properly aligned. And, and lastly, uh, when, when we have a crisis, Coordination failure gets magnified. It is a big problem. In normal times, you know, in Thailand, we already have coordination failures. Mm -hmm. Different government agencies work within their silo frameworks, work within their legal, legal mandate. But during a crisis, you know, we need strong coordination, strong cooperation. Um, this is need strong um, people to, to manage the coordination and also to create proper incentives for different parties to, to, to behave in the way that we would like to, we, we would like to, we'd like to see. For instance, um, most of the corporations, they had more than one creditors. And to come up with debt restructuring, you need all creditors to agree, right? Otherwise, you, 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 you cannot... Um, you, you, you cannot uh, make sure that that company would be able to, to survive or would be able to come out from the distressed um, balance sheet position. So we had to set up a, um, a new framework on corporate debt restructuring and had you know, people coming in, serving as mediator, doing um, balance sheet analysis on behalf of the creditors. And, and had a new... Did you have a comprehensive bankruptcy law or did you have to draw up one? We, we had, we, 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 our bankruptcy law was not up to date and okay. it favored debtors too much. So we had a lot of what we call strategic NPLers, okay. those who could service their debt but decided not to. Um, so we had to amend uh, the bankruptcy law mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that, you know, um, firstly it provides proper incentives. Um, and also we had to we had to introduce the concept of business rehabilitation into the bankruptcy law. Mm -hmm. okay. the, our old bankruptcy law didn't provide opportunity for business rehabilitation or chapter 11 in, 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 in the US. It's very important. And you have to be able to protect new lending by creditors mm. you know, um, during the rehabilitation process, for instance. We also had to set up a new uh, bankruptcy court mm -hmm. Before the 1997 crisis, bankruptcy cases went through the civil courts. And obviously, with the magnitude of the distressed assets, you know, uh, there were not enough judges who had good understanding of finance, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on, on complicated uh, matters. And we needed to have speedy resolution process. We also need to have speedy foreclosure process. And for some small thing like... Um, the seniority of debt, the old bankruptcy law didn't um, provide sufficient uh, seniorities of debt 
to employees. Mm -hmm. So what happened when a company is filed for bankruptcy is all the employees resign. Mm -hmm. But if you would like to promote business rehabilitation was critical at that time. Mm -hmm. okay, um, we had to ensure that um, the seniority of, of debt to employees has the same status. I think you know, it was upgraded to the same status as a debt to the revenue department, mm -hmm. to the government, so that the employees would continue to stay on mm -hmm. and, and, and facilitate the, the, the rehabilitation process. If I can move on to the political dimension, um, so how did they build uh, credibility for the reform program? Um, looking back, one, one key aspect of credibility uh, was the fact that the government that came in in November of 1997 brought in outsiders, you know, professionals, of economic and finance professionals who were very well respected by, 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 by Thai people and by, by, by the finance and economic community to take charge of like, you know, deputy prime minister on economic affairs, um, minister, minister of finance, economic advisors who are so strong you, professional. You brought professionals into parliament, is it? Not into parliament, into cabinet. Into cabinet. Into right. cabinet. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and they came with their track records. They came with their reputations of reform. And, 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 um, and they didn't have to care so much about what their constituency think mm -hmm. about, about reform. So they could carry on the, the, the reform process. And given that there were, there were finance professionals, you know, they were speaking in the same language as, mm -hmm. as, as the fin international financial circles would, would, would like to hear. You know, we had to deal with credit rating agencies, um, we had to deal with international lenders. So they could, they could uh, command respect mm -hmm. from the local people and also from the international financial community. I think that's, that's one. Uh, secondly, the IMF programs, um, you know, uh, on one hand, it restricted a lot of policies that we wished to do. But on the other hand, I mean, there was no choice at the time. We had to let, depend on the IMF programs. But then we use it as a way to build up our own credibility. Mm -hmm making sure that we negotiated the conditions um, that we could deliver. And we had strong commitment to deliver all the condition conditionalities. Um, um, after a few years, um, we decided not to disburse all the money in the program. I mean, the, the size of the program was 17.2 billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. That was huge at that time. Um, and so once we started to see our international reserve being built along the way, we could you know, control, um, stabilize the macro situation. We decided not to disperse the, the, the last few tranches of the IMF program. And indeed, we repaid early. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this was a way to, to build up the credibility. And as mentioned, we successfully renegotiated um, on the fiscal stance with, with, with IMF. And by winning over the IMF, and I mean, they agree to relax some of the conditions. That's also a way to, to build a credibility. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, um, we adopted um, a much higher standard of transparency. Like our international reserves, and everyone was so suspicious about the amount of international reserves that the Bank of Thailand had leading to the crisis. Afterwards, um, the Bank of Thailand decided to disclose the level of international reserves on a weekly basis with two weeks lag. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's obviously, that was inf also influenced by the IMF, but, um, but looking back, it helped provide a lot of credibility. Um, but, you know, but that's also because the stabil stabilization program worked, mm -hmm. and we changed the floating exchange rate regime, allowing the central banks to be able to accumulate reserves bit by bit, and when exports, in the subsequent years, you know, went up uh, strongly that brought in international reserves for, mm -hmm. for, for, for the country. So transparency was, was very, very, very important. Um, we disclosed NPL information on international standards. Before the crisis, the Bank of Thailand's NPL number was 7%. But after the crisis, with international standards and with massive bankruptcy, it went up to 47%. Mm -hmm. So by disclosing using international standards, 
you know, it eliminated all the doubts. Mm -hmm. and, and when you have a lot of doubts mm -hmm. you know, in the financial community, you can't build credibility. Um, and, and lastly, um, I need to emphasize that communication is very important. The government at that time had to do a lot of proactive communication mm -hmm. to different segments of the society, to opinion leaders, you know, to the general public, to um, politicians in different, um, dif different camps of the parliament. Okay. Uh, the root cause of the crisis was from your central bank. So what were the kind of changes that were made? Um, there were quite a number of measures on reforming the, the central bank that were introduced. Um, firstly, the Bank of Thailand Act was, 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 was amended to ensure independence, policy independence and operational independence of, of the central bank. Um, we had some political interference into the work of the, of the Bank of Thailand before the crisis mm -hmm. on, on both um, exchange rate regime and also on bank supervision. So by, by reforming the, the Central Bank Act, the governor, um, you know, there was a new selection process, appointment process of the governor that was not linked with the, with the government before the crisis, you know, when we had a new minister and the new, if the minister didn't like the governor, he could just change the governor for, you know, whatever reason, appropriate reasons. But so it's, uh, it's a fixed term? Now it's a fixed term, five, uh, five years, and can be renewed once. Um, and the selection process is done through a committee of eminent persons. Right. Um, and the, gov the governor cannot be dismissed unless he or she has conducted gross negligence, major gross negligence. Um, we also improve transparency and accountability framework of the central banks in, in, in the new law. Um, we also try to limit possibility of policy mistakes. So in the new law, we had you know, a number of policy, a, a few policy committee, like monetary policy committee, Financial Institution Policy Committee, Payment System Policy Committee. And in these committees, there are more outsiders than insiders to ensure that you know, there would not be policy mistakes by the group think of people in, in, in the central bank. Monetary Policy Committee, we had you know, four outsiders and three um, seen, uh, gov governor and deputy governors of, 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 of the central bank, for, for, for instance. Um, we also changed from the fixed exchange rate regime to inflation targeting. Mm -hmm. And inflation targeting has also been incorporated into, in, in, into our law as a policy framework of, of, of the Bank of Thailand. And, and lastly, I would say that we decided to adopt international standards in all aspects of our work. You know, disclosure standards, banking regulations, licensing standards. Uh, so these this were you know, important uh, changes in the Bank of Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, apart from the central bank reform, uh, were there any other crucial institutional reforms? Um, I, I mentioned um, quite a number of them, um, like you know, the creations of the Public Debt Management Office in the Ministry of Finance um, to coordinate efficient public debt management, and also to develop the local bond market mm -hmm. to ensure that um, to be able to, to accommodate fiscal requirement, a budget deficit requirement, and also the cost of financial sector restructuring. Mm -hmm. We have local financing markets and so that we, we, we would not have to depend on external financing as before the, 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 the crisis. Um, the state-owned enterprise office, um, was, was, was also created um, post-crisis. Uh, we enacted what we call the corporati corporatization law uh, to corporatize state-owned enterprises into, into corporate structure mm -hmm. so that when, 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 um, when we had the right opportunity, we would be able to privatize state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was also a big um, institutional reform, changing um, the structure and the governance of state-owned enterprises and leading to privatization of some of the, some of the key ones. 
um, the bankruptcy law we, we, we touch up on, um, I mean, on the bankruptcy um, framework, the bankruptcy act, um, those those very important. Um, corporate governance for the private sector was also key. We set up what we call the Institute of Directors okay, to ensure that directors of listed companies have to gone through education um, so that they understand about good corporate governance. The, the problems for for Thailand, uh, leading to the 1997 crisis, I would say it's a private sector mm -hmm. problem. I mean, the private sector play a lot of roles leading to, to, to the crisis. And, and, and that's because of the lack of proper, proper corporate, corporate governance. Um, so those, those were some of the key institutional reforms. Another thing that I should highlight is not, it's not related directly to, to the 1997 crisis. Um, we did reform what we call the the fiscal you know, fiscal discipline act mm -hmm. to avoid open ended populist policy. Mm -hmm. um, you might you might recall the, something like the rice pledging schemes yeah. that uh, that um, you know, one government introduced and it became a political norm um, you know, of creating expectations of the public for populist policy like that. And so, there, so was no total, uh, to, there was no total, there was no ex ante calculations of the total cost of, so for the, the government. The, there are hard constraints, is it? It's like fiscal deficit 3%? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, we do have a few questions here, which we may touch on. But finally, how did these reforms that you did then serve you today? Or how has it helped Thailand over the last 30 years? I think I can say that the root causes of the 1997 crisis are no longer major risks for the Thai economy. Okay. Um, you know, wrong policy framework has been corrected. Um, the independence of the Bank of Thailand, um, the monetary policy framework, the exchange rate regimes, you know, those have been um, those have been corrected. Um, international reserve has been rebuilt all along. Um, now we have about two hundred and thirty billion. Can you give us US a dollars? <laughs> yeah, I need. Yeah, I'll carry on that message to the current <laughs> <Okay>. governor. <laughs> um, the banking system, you know, has been quite strong with strong profit profitability and, and strong capital base. When, we, when um, we had to go through the 2009 global financial crisis, Thai banks were not affected at all. Mm -hmm. And Thai banks could continue to provide you know, intermediary functions for the domestic economy. I think the governance structures in the corporate sectors has also improved in, in, in a big way. If looking at you know, international ranking, um, large Thai listed companies have, have performed quite well on the corporate governance front. So the, the old problems, I think, have been, have been solved. But obviously, you know, reform is a never-ending mission. You know, we, we have new problems that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Like before, we didn't have fiscal deficit. We didn't have public debt. Now public debt has indeed exceeded um, the original framework of 60% of GDP. Okay. So last year, after COVID-19, uh, with a lot of measures to stimulate economy and also to to help the most vulnerable groups, the government decided to relax that, that um, public debt to GDP restriction. And but, but what is your interest rates like? Interest rate is quite low. Um, the policy rate of the Bank of Thailand is at um, 0 0.5. 0 0.5. And um, the two-year bond rate now is about 1.7. So your, your cost of servicing that 60% is very low. Yes, but we know that I mean, the cost is going up okay. you know, if you look at the, the, the global um, financial market. And the bath now, you said it went from 25 to 57. Now it's 30? Now it's about 36. Oh, so it slipped it, a little bit. It went down you know, to, it strengthened to about 28, 29, okay. um, five, six years ago. And, and only lately when, you know, there's capital flights from emerging markets going back to mm. advanced economies and there's a tightening global financial conditions. So the BAT has also depreciated along with other emerging market currencies. 
Um, I can, I just have time to take uh, one question which has come through Slido. Um, so about your technocrats and your civil ser service in Thailand, uh, did you have the capacity to handle the crisis? Or did you have to import people? Or was it basically the local bureaucrats who were able to do all the difficult things? During the 1997? Yes. I think the, the, the core teams were, were, tech, were existing technocrats at, okay. at that time. Obviously, we had quite a number of you know, advisors that were coming in to, to help. Um, some of the matters were, were new, and we didn't have to deal with like resolution of distressed assets. Mm -hmm. those, those were new. We were talking about um, reforming some of the laws. You know, um, we, had, we had foreign advisors and international advisors coming in to, to help ensure that we were going in, in, in the right direction. But I would say a lot of things could be, could be handled by, by the technocrats at that time. I think uh, one now is up. Um, any last pieces of advice to Sri Lanka? Well, um, you know, I, I can't um, say anything more than echoing the statement that you know, Mr. President mentioned in his speech. Um, and as highlighted it by the name of this conference, you know, don't, don't lose a good crisis. Mm -hmm. you know, make sure that you, know, you actually bite the bullet, you can bite the bullet, uh, reset, and, and move forward. Mm -hmm. um, procrastinating will only increase the cost financially and also uh, socially for, for the people. Well said, Dr. Viratai. Um, Lots of the issues that he raised today are actually in the program for this two-day conference. So we have a session on bankruptcy, we have a few sessions on SOE, we have a few sessions on land and labor, and then also on revenue. So hope many of you will continue to stay with us for the next two days so that you can participate in a more deeper discussion. And if you cannot be here, you can follow us through uh, Zoom or social media. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Biratai. Most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Biratai and Mr. Murtaza, for that insightful and much needed discussion. A kind reminder for the audience, we do have a Wi-Fi network that you can use. The username is Advocata with a capital A, capital A, D, V, O, C, A, T, A. The password will be reform now, all letters in simple, R, E, F, O, R, M, N, O, W, reform now. You also can send us your questions for each panel through Slido. The password for the platform is hashtag reform now in all capitals. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for being a part of our conference. We are very grateful for your presence. We will now break for tea and recommence our next panel at 10.55 a.m. Please be seated by 10.55 a.m. after the tea break. Hello everyone, during the tea break, you are joining us back at the live stream studio of Reform Now conference organized by Advocata Institute Sri Lanka under the theme, Let's Reset Sri Lanka. And so far, the conference is going smoothly as according to the plan. And as you know, we gave a kickstart to the conference with the keynote speech of none other than the president of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ronil Vikramasinghe. And just as he mentioned, I think, to stabilize the economy, we should all go past the recovery. And as a nation, we all need to survive. With that, 
a solid foundation set for the conference. We then moved into the fireside chat about learnings from the Thailand's reform experience after the Asian financial crisis in 1997. And it was a fireside chat, as you know, between Dr. Virathai Sanji Prabhu, former governor of the Bank of Thailand, and Mr. Murtasar Jafarji, chairperson of Advocata Institute. And during the tea break, we thought of having a solid discussion with the chief operating officer of Advocata Institute, none other than Mr. Dhananath Fernando. Hello to you, Dana. Hi, uh, Ashi. Nice to be here again. <laughs> Good to have you as well. Um, you have been up and running, uh, organizing, and this is a great event, a successful event you're putting forward. I would like to ask you, how are you feeling and how much of work have you gone through to make this a success? Uh, feeling very energetic. Uh, and of course, uh, our view is we are doing this for our people, yeah. uh, people of Sri Lanka, because a reset is much needed. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, we know the economic hardship, so it's so... In our view, the only way out is through reforms and mm -hmm. through a reset, we can only do this. Uh, and that's why we are organizing this. So, so far, we are feeling energetic and positive, and we are very hopeful that the reforms will take place very importantly, mm -hmm. and we all have to do it together. So I feel very, very positive about organizing this event yeah. and having wonderful people around and um, having a full house uh, on the other side of the of the hall, uh, so and feeling, we have people joining happy. us live as well. <laughs> yes, people are also joining uh, live as well. So I'm feeling very positive, and uh, and optimistic about the about the conference. Okay. All right, Dana. So my question to you, uh, for the benefit of uh, all of those who are joining us online, um, can you walk our audience through those who might not be uh, that very familiar with the economics? on what the seven key economic reforms are that Advocata suggests be enacted as soon as possible. Yes, Adita. So this uh, economic reforms uh, or reset theme uh, was stemmed as a result of when the crisis, I mean, we have been alerting the crisis for yes. so, so, so long. And then when the crisis hit, I mean, we are still in the crisis, so we proposed uh, uh, seven main reforms. But that's how from those seven, actually, we came with the theme reset the economy because we realized we have to reset. Yeah. Uh, and then the question is, okay, how are you going to reset? Okay, everyone can say reset, reset, reset. What are you going to do reset? And that's where we came with the seven ideas. So the first one was, our, uh, the first reform that we put forward was because now poor people are suffering because when the inflation is at a, above 50%, when your food inflation is at 84%, people are having a very difficult time, especially the poor people who, have, who spend a lot of their income on their food. Yeah. So for them, I think the first idea was to have a cash transfer system or like a, have a very strong social safety net mm -hmm. uh, because that will make sure that at least they can keep their nose above the water mm -hmm. during this very turbulent and difficult time. Yeah. And we know it's not going to end like tomorrow or in a few weeks. This is going to continue for some time, for a few years. So mm -hmm. at least if you start now, uh, you can at least have something in like next few months. So mm -hmm. a strong social safety net is our first reform. The second one was, now the next question is, okay, you can do a social safety net, but where are you going to find money? Because yeah. for a social safety net, you have to give money. And you don't have money, and that's the problem of Sri <laughs> Lanka. So then we have to have to save money through reforms on state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. And I think that was spoken comprehensively uh, by the Thailand's uh, uh, former uh, the, the governor as well, mm -hmm. Dr. Santi Prabhu. The state-owned enterprises, we are l losing colossal amount of money, just to give you a context, yeah. our airline lost 200 plus billion for four months. Mm. Our The available so social safety net is Samurdi. Yeah. Samurdi, the entire year allocation is about 50 billion. Mm. Our airline lost four times that in four months. And that's only like one institute. We have Petroleum Corporation, we have yeah. Electricity Board, we have multiple other other institutes, like five, about 500 institutes. Yes. We are losing a lot of money. So second thing is, do the reforms on state-owned enterprises. It's not easy, we can save some money. That's the second one. Third is the central bank reforms, that's important. Fourth is also simplifying tax system. Mm -hmm. And fifth is uh, reforms on the micro and small-medium sector, uh, mm -hmm. because we have to do a deregulation uh, for them. Mm -hmm. And also, fifth is also, uh, the sixth is the debt restructuring uh, process. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the main, uh, main six. And also, uh, as the seventh, uh, we have uh, the, the, the revenue side and the trade front, because we have so many trade-related uh, barriers, like on importing, exporting, and all that. So we have to do trade reforms as well. So, so those are the main seven reforms 
uh, that we are uh, focusing at the moment. Right. Just to follow up on that, Dana. Uh, so, um, comparing what you said with uh, the speech that was delivered uh, by the president of Sri Lanka, do you see glimpses of these reforms being ena enacted in the near future? Aditya, there was a saying. Actually, I, 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 I'm, I'm borrowing it from Murtaza. So he said, "The darkest hour is the hour before the dawn." Yeah. Yes, it <laughs> right. Is. So, uh, so I hope. I mean, what we can do is, we put all our effort to get the reforms done. I'm not sure whether it's going to happen or not, but at least we are. When you only put the effort, you can be at least yeah. hopeful that something will happen. Yes. Yeah. I am somewhat hopeful because people have realized that this c system is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And it's the nature of the hu humans that when you realize that something is not going to work, you try <laughs> to figure out something else, right? <laughs> exactly. It's obviously weird for us. Like if you don't have a three-wheeler, you either walk or walk. you try to find <laughs> something else. <laughs> exactly. so it's the nature of the human behavior. So I am hopeful in that sense. Yeah. But I know it's a long journey. I'm mm -hmm. not being like, I don't want to be too optimistic and, you know, ev to, to believe that everything is... You know, it's going to happen like tomorrow and next yeah. week and next month. It will be slow, but I am very hopeful about that. Mm. I think uh, taking that uh, forward, what you mentioned, like how we have to adapt. I think that's the correct word to be used. Like Sri Lankans, um, we we keep coming down a little. You know, e earlier you were using two, three vehicles at the same house, and now you have uh, at least come down to one. But again, you have to stay in petrol queues. But I think you now people are adjusting their lives with the hope that Sri Lanka will get better, right? I think that's a good hope that we all can have. And um, considering all of that, I would like to uh, take your focus into the fireside chat, um, the learnings from Thailand as well. Now, when Thailand went into the crisis, um, let's compare the situation. Now, we are going into, uh, into the crisis. The situation where where Thailand was and where Sri Lanka is right now. What do you think about this? I think the, the nature of the crisis is different from Thailand to Sri Lanka, but I think in terms of the reforms that, you, that, we, that we require, mm -hmm. is pretty much the same. Because mm -hmm. if we, uh, from, from what I gathered from the, the former central bank governor, Dr. Santi Prabhu, so he said they did the central bank reforms, they did the state-owned enterprises reforms, mm -hmm. they brought transparency and accountability into the system, yeah. they had to revise their tax system. So I think though the, because any crisis, it can be, you know, uh, accelerated by different causes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the impact on the people is the same. Their currency depreciated, yeah. interest rates went up. So the, for people, it's the same dose mm -hmm. uh, or like the same medication or like the same beta treatment. Mm -hmm. But maybe their crisis triggered with something else. But I think in terms of the reforms, it's always, Ashi, for, for an economy to be, for an, any economy to be dynamic, yeah. And to be like driving to, 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 to have the all pistons in full capacity, you have to basically, you have to make the efficiency up. Mm. To efficiency, to increase the efficiency, there are set reforms. It's like when you are, if you want to run 100 meters and win Olympics, yeah. there's a technique that you have to do it, right? Yes. You, exactly. you, there, there's, a, there's a technique, you have to check the wind and you have to, you have to sprint and you have to, your muscles has to be stronger, you have to have that optimum height and yeah. that's right you all there's a there's yeah. a technique that you do of course in that b depending on that person you may have different you know some some advantages mm. but the same way though the crisis is different i think it's the remedies are pretty much echoing very much and that's why i actually be invited yeah. uh, uh dr santi prabhu mm -hmm. uh, and also it's the asian region and yes. of course thailand is known for buddhism and there are so many uh, similarities, similarities yeah. and connections with Sri Lanka. That's I think I'm very hopeful in that sense. And I think it's uh, it, there are a lot of similarities and we can learn a lot from them and take this journey forward. Yeah, I think uh, every time I have a discussion with you, Dana, it's quite interesting because you always keep bringing examples from real life and make it really interesting so that anyone who is watching this could understand not just the economists, not just the business um, society, just citizens of Sri Lanka in a whole, it's very important to understand. And talking about reforms, you have this beautiful saying to say, um, reforms are always difficult at the start and messy in the middle and beautiful at the end. <laughs> Why would you come up with such a thing and would you like to elaborate a little bit? Yes, Ashi, basically any change is difficult at the beginning. For sure. If you're, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're sleeping till like uh, late morning for you to wake up slightly early, it's difficult at the very beginning. Yeah. But when you're used to it for like, you know, f 14, 15 days, mm -hmm. then you can, 
you can uh, you know you, you get used to it and then you enjoy it yeah. but uh, same way on the reforms when you start reforming there will be initial resistance because people are always skeptical about it what mm. could happen and they all have their insecurities for mm. an example uh, when you do when you start doing reforms on the state sector or the state owned enterprises the the people who are already employed at the state own enterprises they may yeah. think oh my goodness my job is going to get affected my mm. income is going to go down mm -hmm. things like that mm -hmm. but the, the the reality is having a higher inflation mm. you are basically paying for it though yeah. you are securing a job you yeah. are not your your quality of life is you're deteriorating at a rapid rate so in that front <coughs> it's very it's, it's difficult at the beginning mm -hmm. and when you start reforming process again it's get messy because then the vested interest comes mm. different people have different ideas they also want to do it their own way yeah. it's difficult and then uh, it's messy but you know then there's a storming period and then it becomes like everyone settles down and you get the reform done yeah. and then it becomes like very efficient then everyone sees the benefit then everyone uh, you know embraces it embraces it and then everyone enjoys the fruits of those little seeds that we planted it's True. like same like planting a tree yes. at the beginning you don't see anything when you plant a seed you you know you come tomorrow day after you don't see anything mm -hmm. and you have to water it the process is ma messy you have to put yeah. some effort but when the tree starts growing and when the fruits are coming then only uh, you you enjoy it but you have to have the stamina to do it and to go through that process yeah mm. i think again very well put dana thank you so much for that answer and now talking about the economic crisis we are hitting it right we are going through it and just like president also stated that um, stab to stabilize the economy we all have to go past the recovery and in this form of recovery i would like to ask the question what is really the role of advocata institute so our role has been putting the proper reform ideas forward mm -hmm. and we are believing in markets to work because that's how it has been proven around the world because mm -hmm. it's a subject economics so sure. there's a demand and supply aspect which you can't avoid it's like when you are when you are when you are shooting a rocket mm -hmm. you have to do that gravitational yeah. calculation yeah. right you can't yeah. avoid no no there's yeah. gravitation you don't care yeah. i am putting my rocket on that's the true. orbit that you can't do yeah and but the objective has to be has to be the put the rocket on the orbit you are not like just trying to prove the gravitational theory your objective is somehow to get the rocket off the ground and put it on the orbit yeah. to do that if there's other theories applying mm. uh, if there's something else that is uh, applying that you have to consider that as well so as advocata we are putting a pragmatic a pragmatic plan forward mm -hmm. and creating awareness and getting i mean creating awareness amongst all sri lankans in all three languages yeah. and bring that reset mindset is what we would like to do but mm. basically we are proposing a sri lanka to change and move forward because we believe that we are at crossroads mm -hmm. either we are going to become a failed state or a or a tiger economy yeah uh, that's why i think dr santi prabhu also concluded his remarks don't waste this crisis right and we want to make use of this crisis because what happened is happened there's no point like we are that's pointing right. fingers yes. on like this political party or that politician it mm. it happened mm. now we are all we are all in the same boat there's no point like again fighting inside the bottle uh, right. inside in, inside the boat yeah. so then we have to uh, we have to take everyone together out from this crisis and that's the main role the advocate have been uh, playing uh, so far right then i just uh, uh, just uh, let's go in depth about one of the key reforms that you mentioned i think it will be a good segue for our online audience into the next uh, session as well so just building up on one thing you said about uh, the state owned enterprises i think we did the calculation from 2006 to 2020 the losses of uh, the uh, losses of all if not uh, the big four was close to around 1.5 trillion lkr um so uh, with that what do you think uh, the role of so is is in terms of uh, improving the competition of uh, businesses in sri lanka where do you see what role do you uh, see the so is play there basically on so is are these there are multiple problems now if you look at uh, big so is like petroleum corporation electricity first of all there is a pricing problem because the petroleum sells the uh, petroleum at way below the market rate which yes. you can't do that's problem one that's one reason they are making colossal losses mm. at the same time there are so many inefficiencies also inherited in that organization itself third is it's it's only a monopoly uh, like lanka ioc is there but it's like about 70 to 20% market but electricity it's like a monopoly or a duopoly and when you don't when you have a monopoly in any sector it could be a a private monopoly or a state monopoly yeah. your markets are not functioning well it's like you're putting all the eggs in one basket 
right? right. So because that be becomes the a risk. So on state-owned enterprises, as you very correctly said, we have made about like more than trillion rupees of losses. That's quite vital. So what we need to do is for we are not saying like to all SOEs the same remedy will work. But I think there are certain SOEs it's easier to privatize and get rid of it because we tried that option multiple times to try run it you know run right. it on on our own. Right. But it hasn't worked. Right. So I think there are colossal loss making SOEs that no one will also object because yeah. people are basically paying for it. It's right. not like they are getting anything. They are paying for it. So basically, uh, like Sri Lankan Airlines, that I think has to be privatized. And there could be some SOEs we have to unbundle. Because now if you look at uh, in, uh, electricity, the generation, the, uh, the, the distribution, that has to be unbundled. Now it's all in one. So likewise, there's, there are suits of options that we can take. Uh, but uh, I think that is one of the main areas that we have to do. And that's why we launched a report as well. Thank you so much, Dana, for joining with us during the tea break is what we had this discussion. Thank you so much for joining your experience, um, sharing your experience and joining with us at this discussion. So um, thank you so much for everyone who's joining with us live as well. We would now like to cut off to the main hall for the next session soon after the tea break. They're ready to start off, but we would like to give you a small brief about what we are going to witness as soon after the break. Um, Aditha? Yes. So uh, basically, I think the next session will be one that is of importance for m the Sri Lankan audience because, uh, particularly, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, what happened in India recently, uh, one of the flagship uh, enterprises of uh, the Indian economy, which was uh, Air India, was actually given back uh, to uh, the Tata Group. Uh, it was uh, JRD Tata who founded Air India, uh, founded Tata Airlines way back in the 1930s. And uh, subsequently, it was um, taken under state control. And uh, it had a very similar predicament to uh, Sri Lankan Airlines, as, uh, Dana, as, as Dana very rightly pointed out. And uh, just to quote you, uh, to quote you uh, a, f uh, a few, a few uh, facts and figures about uh, what sort of a predicament that uh, Sri Lankan Airlines is in, just, uh, just in 2021, their loss was an astounding 45 billion LKR, and that is just for 2021. And if you actually visit our social media platforms and just scroll through and look at um, uh, the time series analysis of the losses made by Sri Lanka Airlines, you will actually be surprised as to how inefficiently uh, it has been uh, sort of carried out. So my question to Dana, uh, Dana, there are certain people who uh, think that... Um, an entity like Sri Lankan, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, when you privatize an entity like Sri Lankan Airlines, it's more or less like you're selling the family silver. So why do you have to say to people like that? Yes, Aditya. So that's an often question because people think, right. uh, you know, okay, we are selling something that we own and we are losing something. But the first thing that you need to ask yourself, ask, ask ourselves is, whether do we actually own Sri Lankan Airlines? Now, right. you know, we have been making losses for... Uh, for about 200 billion for four months. So yes. that can't be that we are earning something. No, That means all the taxpayers, including you, me, yeah. everything that we consume, we are contributing taxes to run Sri Lankan Airlines. So basically you are not earning. It's a liability. You are right. spending for Sri Lankan Airlines. Right. And you are basically subsidizing every air ticket or every passenger uh, traveled by Sri Lankan Airlines. Right. Uh, so it's not basically family silver, I would say it's like a family liability because right. you are basically, and it's not like I'm not talking about a one-off incident, it's it may, maybe COVID, we can understand. But for the last 12, 15 years, it's the same. Since Emirates left us with that management agreement in uh, 2000, uh, 2002, 2003, yes. since then, today's 2022, uh, we are basically on the same track. Yeah. So it's not like a one-off incident. So, uh, that's, the, the, so that's how I see it. Uh, right. It's not family silver. And by selling it, we are doing a better job for taxpayers rather than considering it as fa selling family silver. What do you think about these SOEs, uh, how they sort of feed off each other's inefficiencies and in terms of like debt? And do you think that there's an uh, issue there? Yes, Aditya. Uh, basically, uh, Sri Lankan Airlines has borrowed, uh, borrowed oil from CPC, CPC has taken uh, lend money from uh, people's bank so likewise there are so many uh, interconnectivities there and as a result that everyone is suffering because of this one uh, or couple of right. SOEs. Yeah thank you so much Dana I think um, we should keep the ways open 
to see the next session as well. And what do you really think? Should Sri Lankan Airlines be privatized or not? Keep your views open so that we can witness the whole session with an open idea, open mind, and that's what we all need because as Sri Lankans, as civils, we should all get together to reset Sri Lanka with a positive mindset, with a mindset to reset. I think um, on that note, since we have a little bit more time to go forward to the main session, I would like to remind you about our sponsors of, event, of this event who have made this event a great success. And um, starting off with the platinum sponsor, we have Cal. And as a gold sponsor, we have Expo Lanka. And as the event partner, we have FNF, Jetwing Hotels, and Atlas Network. So these are the sponsors and event partners of Reset. Let's Reset Sri Lanka conference organized by Advocata Institute. And you can watch our live stream on different live stream platforms. Let me remind them to you as well. You can watch us live on SLV Log, sorry, SLPolitics.lk, Sri Lanka Students for Liberty, The Morning, the Sunday morning, Daily FT, other economic and business Sri Lanka, businessnews.lk, and through Citizen. And uh, before we wrap up and go to the main session, I would like to take a message from uh, Dananath since we have a little bit more time. Uh, what is the message you would like to give out to the public on this whole conference? And um, would you like to say a few words about it? Yes, Ashi. Uh, basically, I'm very grateful for our sponsors, first of all, as you mentioned. Yes. And for the public, it's the important thing is we are putting this conference together for the first time uh, in Advocata's history, just as a service for people, just to understand the depth of the reforms, because everyone has now been impacted by the economic crisis. But when we are coming out from that crisis, that every, everyone has to put their, you know, everyone has to contribute uh, to overcome this crisis, but to contribute, you should know the facts and details and the scientific method of how we need to do reform. So that's what Advocata is putting forward, and it doesn't mean that what we all say has to be like, you know, it's a discussion that we are creating. Of course, yeah. different people have different views, and we all respect, uh, we, we, we respect all those views. Mm -hmm. We are just bringing a one side of the story, and we try to provide like a overall side of the story but of course different people have different views mm. and we respect all that and when Definitely. we also have that healthy discussion only we can come up with a proper solution as we as we mm. said it's uh, it's uh, it's difficult at the beginning it's messy in the middle but when everyone come together it's beauty it will be beautifully at the end yeah i think we face a similar situation with the global pandemic situation with the covid 19 when it all hit the whole globe we had no idea how to cope up with the situation we were all stuck at home but just like you say it's very difficult at the start and messy in the middle but it's beautiful at the end because i think that's the time where the country and a lot of entrepreneurs came up with the best ideas and innovation innovations and coming into technology even the people who didn't use technology started using technology and I think right now coming into economic crisis that was for a form of a practice for all of us so even now if you are working from home you were already you already have the experience because you had the practice you were trained to work from home during the COVID-19 I think this is these are things that we have to look um, with a positive mindset and uh, it's wonderful to see how we are getting adjusted to a QR system that are at a petrol station, right? This is These are something we never expected. So even um, the older generation who was not used to this is uh, trying to use the QR codes and get into the course as well. And now I think we are ready to go into the next session, we, it's, which is about Air India privatization story, takeaways for Sri Lanka. What is your point of view? Keep in mind, let's join soon with the light.